because I know you want to save it for the, <laughs> for the next interview. But when this particular cataclysm happened, I mean, this was a global event. And you, you, you mentioned volcanic winter, for which for folks who don't know, that would be like a nuclear winter. So Same I guess thing. this this dust Same. just encapsulates the entire planet and right. screws everything up. It, a lot of people say, well, you know, gee, Mount St. Helens erupted and I'm still alive. We're not talking about a little piddly, vol- you know, cone-shaped volcano. We're mm-hmm. talking about a monster. We're talking about something that it, if it were to super erupt in in its full intensity, would it, it would just be un thinkable mm-hmm. what the dev and and it's not just the devastation that occurs when it erupts in fact that's the least of your problem right it's what happens afterwards to the climate to agriculture to uh you know what happens geopolitically and mm-hmm. there could be total anarchy we're already beginning to fight for for water resources yes. and all all that stuff we talk about we actually in one of our chapters present a fictional scenario of what might happen over the weeks and months and years following a super eruption. Wow. Well, we will definitely. It's, it's scary. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, without a doubt. Well, we will definitely have you back on to discuss that. Oh, yeah, that'll be fun. <laughs> and you also wrote a book, um, Looking for God in All the Wrong Places. I just want to ask you a couple of questions about that. Sure. Fill me in on that one, because that one I'm not aware of the, the subject matter on, you but know, it's a great name. Just- one of the it's sort of a spiritual humor book of essays um at the time i wrote it it was 2002 i just you know it was just one of those things that i really feel like sitting down and writing a book and it was where i was at spiritually with my sort of metaphysical evolution with a lot of sarcasm and humor and mm-hmm. personal insight so it it's nonfiction, but it's sort of a encapsulation of my journey at the time and some of my commentary about what was going what's going on at the in the world at the time and how mm-hmm. that related to my own spiritual growth it's funny because when i went to your page on um amazon they showed science um how new discoveries in quantum physics may explain the existence of paranormal phenomena right. and they they had it paired with uh i believe his name is bernard hate hasek um the god theory right i was like ooh, i like I that know. They've because, been pairing it with some real, I mean, Dean Radin, I mean, yes. some great books. So, <laughs> I mean, honored. you are, yeah, you are in excellent company. So, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're very great. much pleased to have you on here. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's talk about the book a little bit. Um, how long did it take you to write this and, and what kind of journey was it for you while you were creating the book? It took me five months to write. That's not um, long at all. No, not that long. And, uh, Super Volcano, we only had six months. So, okay. you know, we're under the, under the gun, but it's actually better that way because the more time you have, the more time you have to waste. And with a book like Science, basically a lot of the research I had already done because I'm such an avid reader. Same I mean, here. I just devour books. Mm-hmm. And so I had a lot of my research at my fingertips. And, and I was able to, from a book proposal, from a chapter summary and an outline, just sort of stack my research in chapter order. I knew exactly the direction of the book, and I just kind of dove in. And what I did is I, I I thought to myself, I'm not a scientist. What you know? How could I write a book about this kind of stuff that some other Joe Schmo like me is going to get, is going to mm-hmm. understand, and even have a little fun with? I think that's I think that's exactly the right way to do it. I actually try to do the same thing on this show because I I'm not a scientist either, but I'm an avid reader like yourself. I yeah. have I have all these various interests, and I think that um. This information, you kind of have to, well, you don't have to, but it's it's nice to make it fun and interesting for people because if it's very dry literature with a great deal of technical terms and, and you're not humanizing it a little bit, sometimes it turns people off and then they miss out on this great uh, voyage of finding out all this oh, new information. Does. I mean, it turns me off. Yeah, same here. There have been books that I've closed after Chapter 2 because I felt like I was either being talked down to, like mm-hmm. I was a six-year-old, or uh, I just was like, I don't, what the heck is this person trying to say? And, and right. please stop with the mathematical equations, mm-hmm. my God. You know? Yeah, that turns people off, and then they miss out on, on being enlightened onto this new material and these new ideas. The book is divided up into three parts, and right. um, I was looking at it. It's like, you've got some great stuff in here. Let's, let's start off talking a little bit about UFOs, ETs. We talk about that a lot on, on the show. Right. It's, it's actually a, a subject that, that I'm, I enjoy a great deal. But near I want to dear to your heart. Huh? Yes, yes, but but a lot of the things you've got listed are. So let's talk a little bit um, about your ideas regarding UFOs and ETs and how um, your book describes the ideas that some of this 
some of these experiences could p- possibly be explained um, given our new knowledge of quantum uh, physics and, and things of that nature. And, and the funny thing is, is that since I wrote the book, I'm hearing more and more about it going in this direction with the mm-hmm. UFO field. Basically, I mean, I, I'm a, a somebody who has been interested in the subject matter like you for years. And, you know, it starts out with that sort of nuts and bolts interest in mm-hmm. the the craft that may be coming from another planet with little aliens in it. It's a very uh, nuts and bolts kind of thing. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to look at the different types of UFO sightings. And then see how new discoveries in not just quantum and theoretical physics, but, you know, new science, the science of consciousness and, and intention that we're hearing all about. How, did the, how could these possibly apply? And so I, I just sort of took different types of sightings, like the nuts and bolts sightings, if they're coming from another point in our own universe or another universe entirely, how could they be getting here? Mm-hmm. And I then looked at things like, well, okay, we're told in quantum physics that there may be the existence of this thing that is called the zero-point field. Yes. And this is a very fundamental field of energy, self-regenerating. It's It exists in every you know inch of, of space and uh, could possibly be a source of fuel for these objects. Marie, just for a second, um, sure. for our listeners who may not be aware of this, kind of, if you can, break it down just a little bit what this idea of zero-point energy is. This is a huge idea, and I probably shouldn't have introduced it later, but it's funny because every subject that I wrote about, UFOs, ghosts, it kept coming up. Mm-hmm. Well, basically, what I learned about the zero-point field is that it, it is a, it's a literal sea of energy that we're swimming in. We're like fish in the ocean, swimming mm-hmm. around in this sea of energy that where particles are literally popping in and out of existence all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the closest we get to a state of absolute zero momentum. There is a slight jiggle. So there is something happening. There is this, this very rock bottom source of energy. And, and a, you know, a scientist will tell you it's the most minute rate of oscillation allowable in quantum physics. But what the people that are studying it, people like Hal Pudoff, people like Dean Radin and Lynn mm-hmm. McTaggart, who wrote the book, The Field, mm-hmm. one of my absolute all-time favorite books, is that this could be a potential source of fuel, of, of energy that we can use as fuel. And it never runs out. I mean, it's infinite. It, it's self-regenerating. I know that the, Stephen Greer is a big proponent of that idea, I believe. Yeah, the only problem that we have as human beings with our limitations is how do we extract it? Mm-hmm. Well, you then can say to yourself, if there are advanced civilizations out there, that uh, people like Carl Sagan and, and Michio Kaku, theoretical physicist Michio Kaku, have talked about you know, possibly existing. Well, heck, if they've figured out a way to extract this energy... They could be zipping around, of course, defying gravity, not just moving across our universe beyond the speed of light, but between universes. Mm-hmm. Because theoretical physicists are telling us that chances are pretty good there are parallel universes that exist right alongside our own. And, you know, then you start tying all these things into the zero point field, like wormholes. You know, could wormholes be shortcuts in from one universe to another? Mm-hmm. Is the zero point field filled with wormholes that take you from here to there? So it's really just like this journey of discovery of one theory to the next, and then I would try to find ways that they possibly could apply to the types of UFO sightings that I've read about. The interesting stuff, though, is when you get into the more uh, the, the more intriguing types of sightings, where they almost appear to be holographic projections. Okay, it might be coming from another dimension, mm-hmm. um, where they act as if they know that they're being observed and actually behave uh, or sort of interact with the observer. Mm-hmm. That's the real interesting stuff to me. Let me ask you this. As, as a field um, investigator for MUFON, um, do, what were like the most interesting things that you came across during that 15 years? I mean, did you come across any particular cases where you were really, truly blown away? You know, it's funny because when I was involved, it was literally at the height of the whole abduction thing. It it Mm -hmm. had just started to get really hot Mm -hmm. back in the 80s. And um, I, you know, I got to talk to and and investigate and research and interview a lot of people who claim to be abductees. And I got to tell you, after a while, it got really boring. Sure. Um, But something bothered me about the whole thing. To me, 